good morning. Thank you for tuning in to hear the Word of God preached today. I want to start off this morning by telling you about a man named Tegu. And the reason that name sounds a little different than names we often use here in America is because Tegu was born in Indonesia. And from a very early age, as a, as a Buddhist, he was taught to hate Christians, especially this Jesus guy. And for the first 14 years of his life, he hated Christians with a passion, although he had no clue why. It's just what he thought he was supposed to do. Well, when he was 15, he moved temporarily to the U.S., and that's when he was first introduced to Christianity and to the church. But it wasn't long before their visa expired and they went back to Indonesia. But all of a sudden, something was different. Whenever he went to the Buddhist temple now, something was missing. He knew there had to be more to life than this. And so without his parents knowing, he attended a Christian small group. A little while later, uh, his parents finally saved up enough money to move to the United States, where he quickly got involved in a church. And on November the 19th of 2005, Tigu was baptized. And even though he kept it from his parents, somehow they found out. They kicked him out of the house. They told him they never wanted to see him again. And with nowhere to go, he moved to Missouri to live with his aunt. And from there, his faith has only grown. And today, he's actually a youth pastor in a Christian church in Illinois, sharing the love of Jesus every single day. Now, some of you, as I was telling that story, maybe you downloaded our, our sermon outline off of FCCGreensburg.com, and you saw the title of the message today that says losing your religion and you thought to yourself has our pastor lost his mind <laughs> I thought that's why we were watching this I thought we were supposed to find religion I thought religion would set me free correction Jesus will set you free and in Tigu's situation he walked away from his religion and he discovered the way the truth and the life and you know what? I think the best thing that could happen to the American church that has gotten so off course in so many ways today is if we walk away from our religion and our man-made set of rules and we discover that incredible joy, the amazing freedom, and the fresh grace that Jesus Christ offers. Now, let me clarify this just a little bit by going way back to a 19th century theologian named Soren Kierkegaard. He identifies two different kinds of religion, what he called religion A and religion B. Now, religion A, he says, is faith in name only. It's the practice of attending church without a genuine faith in the living Lord, a faith that does not bear fruit. And then there's religion B. And that, he said, is life transforming and destiny changing. It is a sincere commitment to the crucified and risen Savior, which establishes this ongoing personal relationship between a forgiven sinner and a very gracious God. And just like was the case with C.S. Lewis, the famous theologian, for several years before he became a Christian, so many people that we are around every day have a hard time seeing religion be that sincere faith and what a sincere walk with Jesus looks like because they are blinded by way too much religion A. And that's where we here at FCC and even the Big C Church in general, we have to step away from any form of watered down or nationalistic or legalistic religion. And we have to look solely to God's word and what it teaches about following Jesus with all of our hearts. So maybe a better title for the message today would be losing religion A and finding Jesus. But listen, that didn't fit on the sermon outline, okay? But that's really what Paul is talking about here in Philippians chapter 3. And if you remember, the entire theme of the book of Philippians is joy. Joy, walking in a joy that is full and that is overflowing, that has nothing to do with your circumstances and the storms that are raging all around you. Now, chapter one started us off right by kind of trying to focus our 21st century ADD minds and talk about the single mind, the single focus on Jesus, that we have to be focused uh, as a body and, and doing life with other believers that, yes, the Bible talks about that we need to be a part of a local church body. 
And then we need to be furthering the gospel by having a kingdom mindset in everything we do. Chapter two was all about the submissive mind, being humbled before your heavenly father, letting that humility control your horizontal relationships with everyone around you. So the single mind the submissive mind, and then today we're going to talk about what's called the spiritual mind. And we're not talking about this kind of weirdo, I'm a spiritual being type of witchcraft that we often see today in our culture. I'm not talking about this loosey-goosey, phony spirituality that Oprah has endorsed for many years. I'm talking about true spirituality that is founded on Jesus Christ and that is based on the Word of God. Okay, so go ahead, grab your outlines for me. And the first thing I want you to see is that true spirituality requires me to count, to count. Now, go ahead, turn with me here to Philippians chapter three. I'm gonna step off camera for a second here and get my Bible, uh, Philippians chapter three. And my hope is that, that you are getting familiar with where this book is in the New Testament as we come now to the fourth week of this series. And as you're turning there to Philippians 3, I want to remind you that Paul is writing from prison in Rome all because he's preached Jesus. And where it would have been so easy to be down, to be depressed, to be woe is me, that's not what we see at all in Paul. All because Paul is focused on his mission and he's humbled before his heavenly father, he is now overflowing with joy. And a part of that is because he's like a kid in a candy store. Right now he has the chance to witness to all these high-ranking officials every single day. He's seeing the gospel take off in the most powerful city in the entire world. All because he's in chains. Okay, so let's start here. You should be in Philippians 3 with me. And let's look here starting in kind of the second part of verse 4. Here's what he says. Philippians 3, verse 4. If someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, Paul says, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But then listen to this, because he's not trying to brag about these things, okay? He says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage or rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Now, it really is amazing how our lives change when we go from religion A to truly finding our identity in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Because let's just be honest, from the world's viewpoint, Paul had no reason to walk away from his former life. It was comfortable. He was well-known and admired. He didn't want for much. And he had sat at the feet of the famous Jewish teacher Gamaliel, had even risen up through the ranks, and now he had a ton of power. He was seen as a rising star among the religious leaders, among the Pharisees. This guy was the epitome of success in their Jewish faith and culture. And if anybody was going to heaven, if anybody was close to God, the Jewish community would say it was a guy like Saul. I mean, he was the one that you point your kids to in that culture and say, hey, that's who you need to grow up to be like. He was educated. He was sophisticated, talented, influential, had a ton of charisma. But yet, like Tigu, something was missing in his life. It wasn't filling him up. He had enough morality to keep him out of trouble, to look holy, but not enough righteousness to get him into heaven. And so he had to lose his religion, A, to find salvation, to find a true purpose and a true joy that only comes when you and I walk with the ultimate rabbi, Jesus Christ. 
Now, the word picture Paul gives us is one of an accountant. He says, I count. Some translations like the NIV, which we just read from, use the word consider, which is actually a pretty good translation. But honestly, I think count is a little bit better of a translation because it comes from this world of accounting. It helps us to better understand this passage. So now listen to it a little bit as I put the word count in there. He says, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I count them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. So trophies, accomplishments, accolades, promotions, Ivy League schools, big bank accounts, crowds of followers, fancy cars, not bad things in and of themselves necessarily. But Paul says, listen, those things no longer have a hold on me. Those things that I once chased after don't matter now. Okay. And I would give them up, Paul says, a hundred times over to be smothered in the love, grace, and peace of my Lord Jesus Christ. See, I think all of us at some point in our lives, in some way, have said to ourselves, if only I had this, <laughs> whatever that is, if I had more money, I've heard so many Christians say that, if only I had more money, if only I had more time, then my life would be easier, then I would walk in joy, if only, if only, if only, but what Paul wants us to see is that's garbage, True spirituality, true joy is when you change your values and you make Jesus your number one priority in life, when you're actually willing to stop talking about it and do it and make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Leave all those idols behind and place Jesus number one. And you realize that those things, those idols that you had on your heart before, they didn't satisfy anyways. In fact, they only made us hunger more and more for what was truly filling and feel even more empty inside when we ran after those things. Now, when I say the company name Borden, what is it that you kind of picture in your head? Now, if you're thinking of milk and dairy products, then you got it, okay? And I'll be honest with you. Uh, the picture that I'm showing you here is of a man born into the Borden family who had nothing to do with the success of this company. However, he had everything to do with inspiring many Christians, many lives to follow the motto, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets. William Borden was born into a rich family. He would no doubt be a great leader, so talented. When he graduated from high school at 16, mind you, his parents gave him a trip around the world as a gift. Now, I think my parents just kind of booted me in the behind and said, good luck. <laughs> I didn't grow up in a rich family like that. So he got a trip around the world, but it was on that trip that his life would forever be changed. See, William was a Christian. But it wasn't until he saw the hurt and the pain throughout the world that his heart went deeper with Jesus, that he broke to share the love of Christ with others. And now God had placed it so strong on his heart. He wanted to be a missionary. After his trip, he went to college. He went to Yale and graduated with a bachelor's degree. And then he went to Princeton and got his master's. Other than the option of helping run the family business, he had several lucrative job offers to, uh, because of his great leadership and his wisdom. This guy was a rising star, much like Paul was when he was young, when Saul was young. He had all the potential in the world. We're talking about a man who could have been probably one of the greatest CEOs of his time that we could be watching shows on the History Channel about. But instead... He saw the big picture, the eternal perspective. He left every bit of that behind to follow the King of Kings into the mission field. And he eventually gave up his life for the cause of the gospel. It really is amazing how the hymn written by Helen Limmel is so very true. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You know, once we lock eyes with the Savior, once our hearts are melted by the amazing grace of Jesus and we realize the God-sized purpose that he created us to fulfill, 
then we will no doubt be able to join Paul in saying, I count everything loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. I also love the words of Jim Elliott, a man who was killed on the mission field uh, by the very group of people he came to love and share Christ with. And the amazing thing is his family eventually went back and led most of them to Christ, which is the most amazing redemptive story. But he once said this before he died. He said, he is no fool to give what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Now, there's a lot to process there. Let me say that again. He is no fool to give what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. True spirituality requires that I count it all loss for the sake of Christ. Now, second, I want you to see that true spirituality requires that I press on, requires me to press on. Now, go ahead and turn with me here to Philippians chapter 3, and let's pick up here in verse 12. Philippians 3, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this, Paul says, or have already arrived at my goal. So we're always a work in progress, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, listen to this, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, if there's one lesson that God has taught me over the last 15 years of my life, it's the importance of pressing on. It does no good to run every time life doesn't go our way. Because if, if you do, you're going to always be running. And some people do. It does no good to run every time we mess up. It does no good to run when you have critics. Because we all do. We've all had people lie about us. Okay? It does no good to run when the mountain looks too steep. We press on. We dig our heels in. We anchor ourselves to the rock Jesus Christ through his word, through prayer, and we remain faithful as children of God. We remain faithful to the Lord. We remain faithful to his church. And there are going to be times where that storm is raging all around you and you are tired and you are exhausted and you don't feel like you can hang on any longer. We've all been there. But by the grace of God, we hang on to Jesus with everything we are. In 1862, shortly after the Civil War began, Abraham Lincoln was faced with probably the hardest situation, in my opinion, that a president has ever had to endure. He was called to lead his nation through a civil war. And he once said uh, at the outset of the war in a letter he wrote to William Seward, he said, I expect to maintain this contest until successful or till I die or till I'm conquered, or till my term expires, or Congress or my country forsake me. <laughs> and I'm sure that you can see the humor and the sarcasm in that. But the reality was that Lincoln saw the right direction for the nation, what God would want him to do, and he'd already made the decision, regardless of how popular he was, to press on, to dig his heels in, and to stay the course. And we're called to do the same thing. No matter what opposition comes against us, no matter what is said against us, no matter what Satan tries to do to us, we're called to be people who are guided by the word. And in that, we find God's purpose for our life, for the purpose of our church family, and we press on for the sake of Christ. I, I like the very short yet powerful quote by Steve Campbell. He said very simply, I refuse to allow defeat to be my legacy. And having just studied the book of Joshua, we can add to that. I refuse to allow defeat to be my legacy because I'm a child of God. And as a child of God seeking his will, I will walk in his victory because he is the one fighting my battles. Now, to stay with kind of the, the presidential examples, it's said that our, our seventh president, who was Andrew Jackson, his boyhood friends uh, just could not believe that he became a great general and then the president. They were shocked. They said they knew of other men, even in their area, who had much greater talent, but who never succeeded. One of his boyhood friends actually said, he said, why Jim Brown, who lived right down the pike from Jackson, 
was not only smarter, but he could whoop Andy three times out of four in a wrestling match. But look where Andy is now. And another friend said, well, how did there happen to be a fourth time? I thought three times and you were out. And he said, sure, they were supposed to, but not Andy. He would never admit he was beat. He would never stay down. Jim Brown would finally get tired, and on the fourth try, Andrew Jackson would win. Now, church, there's something to be said for that type of perseverance and never giving up. There's something to be said for spiritual staying power. And I've met a lot of Christians who were flashy, who, who talked the game and who were well-spoken and they had all the answers to all of life's questions. But the second things got tough, they fell apart spiritually. True spirituality requires us to count it all loss for the glory of knowing Christ. And it requires that we press on for the cause of Christ. We press on for the greatest mission that we could ever be called to. No matter what happens, no matter what hardship you walk through in life, you can press on because God is your strength when you can't go on any longer. I like how Psalm 42, 1 and 2 puts this and what our hearts need to be doing when times are hard. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And then the last thing I want you to see here, true spirituality requires me to look forward, to look forward. Now, I don't know if you picked up on this, but we've talked about our past, how we counted all loss compared to knowing Christ. We've talked about the present and how important it is for us to remain faithful, to press on for Christ. And now let's talk about the best part for those who know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Let's talk about the future, okay? Let's talk about the hope that we have. And here Paul is basically describing himself as an alien. And I'm not talking about some green guy from outer space because the government all of a sudden decided to declassify a lot of information. He's saying that this world is not our home. Yeah, he sees the, his purpose. Yeah, he loves his life and the incredible people that God has networked him with. But in the end, Paul has hope that nothing in this world can take away. Look with me here at Philippians chapter 3, and let's pick up here in verse 20. Here's what Paul says, and I, I love these verses. Maybe you've heard them before. Verse 20. But our citizenship, as Christians, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. I can't wait. <laughs> there was a, a man who passed away a few years back who they called Uncle Johnson. And the amazing thing about this guy that kind of made him a hometown hero in his small town is he lived to be 120 years old. That is incredible. You just don't hear that often. And, and many people attributed kind of his long life to the joyful spirit that he seemed to have always. One day he was out in his garden, well past 100 years old. Could you imagine working in your garden over 100 years old? And he was singing praises to God. And his pastor just happened to be walking by and he looked over the fence and he said, Hey, Uncle Johnson, you seem pretty happy today. And he said, Yeah, I was just thinking. He said, What were you thinking about? He said, I was just thinking if the crumbs of joy that fall from the master's table in this world are so good, then what will the great loaf in glory be like? He said, I tell you, sir, there'll be enough for everyone and some, sp some to spare up there as well. You know, I've, I've always admired people uh, who have dual citizenship, or at least I, I like to ask them questions. And I have a friend from Rush County named Robert Poldervart. Uh, I love Robert. He's a friend of mine. Robert is from Holland, and um, but he, he lived in Holland, or actually he grew up, he had a dad who had a pretty successful career, so he actually lived all over the world. And so he's a pretty cultured guy. So great stories that I love to hear. But he met an American girl many years ago, and she kind of lured him here. And I'm just joking about that. But, but several years ago, he went through the process of becoming an American citizen. And I've always thought that was kind of cool uh, to talk with people who have dual citizenship. 
Now, uh, right from home, raise your hand for me if you have dual citizenship. I bet you somebody watching this today does. And I got to thinking about that this week. And I realized that all of us who know Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you think about it, we have dual citizenship. There's no question that we love the good old red, white, and blue, that we are proud to be Americans. And several of you have probably served our country uh, in the military. And to you, I want to say thank you. Thank you. I feel so blessed to be an American, and I'm so thankful for those who fought and even died for the freedoms we have. But the reality is that this place, America, will not be our home forever. Okay, someday our days on this earth will expire. And if we belong to Jesus, we'll be ushered into heaven right before his presence for all eternity. And it will be beyond our wildest imaginations. It will be perfect. And what Paul wants us to see here is sometimes it's okay. It's okay to lose your religion, your religion A, if that means finding Jesus and having that ultimate hope and that ultimate joy of being with him for all eternity. That's what keeps us pressing on and going, that hope that we have in Christ. So let's review a little bit here as we close. I count it all lost for the sake of knowing Jesus. I press on. I'm not going to quit. No matter who comes against me, no matter what's said about me, no matter what happens in this life, no matter how hard Satan fights against me, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to press on to win the prize for which God called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And then I look forward to the day where I will stand before my Savior as white as snow, not because of anything I've done, because my good deeds are filthy rags, but all because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'll have that new body with a six pack of abs, all the chicken wings I can handle (laughs) or something like that. But what an awesome hope. Church, listen to me. What an awesome hope that we have in Christ right now and for all eternity. All because of Jesus Christ, we can be joyful. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your incredible word. Thank you for how you speak to us in our toughest times of life, in the joys of our life, and in the craziness and the stress of kind of everyday life. God, your word has a way because it's Holy Spirit inspired of just speaking right into our situation. So thank you for that. God, I pray that no matter what I'm walking through, that you are moving in that and you are growing me, that you are maturing me and that you are helping each of us to walk closer to you and be formed more and more as that mold in your in your hands, as that, that clay in your hands that you are shaping to look more like Jesus. Thank you for your word. May we be your church that walks in joy, staying true to your word and walking in your will and having that evangelistic heart to love our world into your arms. Jesus, you're awesome. We love you. We pray all of this in your precious name. God's people said, amen and amen. Hey, if you have any questions about what it looks like to follow Jesus or about the Christian faith, or you want to talk about making that decision to follow Christ and just what the Bible teaches on that, we would love to walk alongside you in that. Okay. So give us a call here in the office, 812-663-8488. My name is Ray. I'd love to talk to you. 663-8488 or email me at ray at fccgreensburg.com. Hey, God bless you. I pray that you have a joy-filled week as you walk with Christ.